Greetings, friends and brethren. This is Dr. Bob Teal for the Continuing Church of God. Should people accept Jesus? What about atheists? You know, is Jesus the Messiah or not? Can you be proven either way? Well, I think there is proof. I think there's sufficient proof, even for atheists, if they're willing to take a look at it. If you're an atheist or a Jew or a Muslim or whatever, I think if you have real love of the truth, and you'll properly review the evidence, the truth would lead you to accept Jesus as the Messiah. Now, some of you already looked at the evidence and you made your decision, and that's great. But even if you looked over the evidence before, I'm, I'm hoping that with this sermon I can help you have more information so not only can you be personally helped, but that you can also help others who have questions or might struggle with their Christian faith. Now, there's over 200 prophecies from the Old Testament writings that Jesus fulfilled. And we go over those in a book that we have called uh, uh, Proof Jesus is the Messiah. Now, this book, which has a lot of what I'm going to go over today, is available free at the www.ccog.org website. Go to the literature tab, click under Books or Booklets, and you can find this, and you can read it. It's there. You don't have to give us your email address. We're not. There's no tricks. You can just have it if you want to read it. And I'm not going to go through those, all those 200 today, but I'm going to go through some other things. And there's also uh, secular evidence. There's also some prophetic evidence. And even uh, according to certain Jewish interpretation of Hebrew scriptures, Jesus came when the Messiah was supposed to. Now I mentioned about prophecy. Now, can prophecy be any kind of evidence? Is it important at all? Well, if we go to the book of Revelation, Revelation chapter 19, starting verse 10, and I'll be reading from the New King James. It says, For the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. So according to the Bible, fulfilled prophecies are testimonial evidence. Now, even if you don't believe scriptures are inspired, and let's say atheists don't, uh, you're not uh, interested in that, if they've been fulfilled outside of the Bible, you should at least give some consideration that maybe there's some, some reality for this. We're supposed to be certain, by the way, about Jesus being the Messiah, not just, oh yeah, there was a Jesus, and yeah, he probably came, yeah, I think he did, maybe. We're, we should have certainty. In Luke's Gospel account, Luke begins chapter 1 and uh, makes a few comments about why he's writing. Okay, Luke wrote, Inasmuch as many have taken in hand to set in order a narrative of those things which have been fulfilled among us, just as those who from beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word delivered to them to us. It seemed good to me also, having a perfect understanding of all things from the very first, to write to you an orderly account, most ec excellent Theophilus, that you may know the certainty of those things of which you were instructed. And we need to have certainty that the Bible is the Word of God, Jesus is the Messiah. Uh, we have uh, uh, information, again, about Jesus. I held up uh, the book, the book we have on that. And as far as the Bible goes, we've got a book called Who Gave the World the Bible? Also available at ccog.org website. Now I'd like to read something the Apostle John wrote. This is from 1 John, 1 John 5. You can follow along if you want. I'm going to start verse 12. He who has a son has life. He who does not have a son of God does not have life. These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life and you may continue to believe in the name of the Son of God. So John is saying, look, even though you believe, you need to continue to believe and I want to help you do that to know that this is for sure, this is true. Now one of the reasons we need this type of certainty is so we can handle the uh, coming physical and uh, verbal persecutions. You can read about them, for example, in Daniel 11, verses 30 to 37, and John 15, 20. And we also need to pray that we can, and we also have a book that I'm looking down here uh, called uh, Prayer, What Does the Bible Teach? So here it is, also available at ccog.org. 
2 Peter 3.18, Peter said we're supposed to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And this sermon, I'm going to go through various scriptures as well as other information that I hope will help you with do that. The better you know that Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah, the, our Savior, the more uh, steadfast you can be. Uh, the Bible says we're, we're not supposed to be sta unstable or double-minded. Read that in uh, James in a couple of places. But we're supposed to know and act on the truth. Now, for this sermon, I'm not going to go over... Uh, this is a, chapter 2 of this book, which is basically 200 scriptures in the Old Testament and then 200 more from the New Testament uh, showing that Jesus fulfilled various things. But there's a few I want to just kind of highlight. In Micah 5.2 it says that the Messiah was supposed to be born in Bethlehem and in Matthew 2.1 it says that happened. Uh, according to the book of Daniel, Daniel 9 verse 24 to 25, if you add certain things up when certain things happen, the Messiah was supposed to start his ministry around 27 AD, and Jesus did do that. Uh, book of uh, First Chronicles, and uh, as well as Isaiah 35, verses 5 through 6, say the Messiah was supposed to perform uh, wonders and miracles, and that happened. You can read that throughout the Gospel accounts. Deuteronomy 18, 18 said that the Messiah would be a prophet, and we see that confirmed in Matthew 13, 38 to 40. Isaiah 49 and 53 say that he, the Messiah would be rejected by his own people, and we saw that in the book of John, like John 1.1. 1, 1. Some get more specific, like Zechariah 11.12 said the Messiah was supposed to be betrayed for 30 pieces of silver, and we see that happen in Matthew 26.14-15. Various passages in the Old Testament say that the Messiah is supposed to be put to death. And we know that that happened. You can read that in the Gospel accounts. In Daniel 9.26, it says Messiah is supposed to be cut off before Jerusalem and the Temple were to be destroyed. And that's consistent with secular history. Jesus was killed in uh, 30, 31 AD. And the Temple was destroyed uh, in 70 AD by uh, General Titus. The time frame fits. The Bible says no prophesied no bone would be broken uh, in uh, Psalms, Exodus, and Numbers, and we see that in uh, being recorded in John 19:36. Zechariah 11:13 said that the silver for, for Jesus being betrayed by would be used to buy a potter's field, and we see that happening in Matthew 27, uh, verses 6 through 8. And the Psalms talk about the Messiah would not stay dead, he'd be resurrected, and we can see that throughout uh, the Gospels as well as in Acts and Corinthians. Now the plain truth is that Jesus fulfilled many Old Testament prophecies and will fulfill others that I'm not going to be going over right now. Statistically, it could only have been Jesus that fulfilled them. The probability of uh, someone filling what Jesus fulfilled, there had to be a divine aspect to this. No randomness, and I'm going to get more statistics later. Now, is there any historical evidence that supports the idea that Jesus was Messiah? Well, one kind of piece of evidence I think is a legitimate one is that there's more New Testament, ancient New Testament documents that mention him than any other figure in ancient history. There's actually at least 5,800 uh, Greek documents that contain at least part of the New Testament. That's a massive amount of information or data or artifacts, if you want to call them that, by historical standards. Remember, they didn't have smartphones, they didn't have printer and presses and things like that back then. Of course, some will discount that and say, well, that's not relevant. But again, it was very hard to get all those copies and why would they do something for somebody who wasn't there? There's also something called the James uh, Ossuary. Now, an ossuary is a, bone, a box they put people's bones in. They would bury you in like a cave or something. And then after your flesh was gone, they put your bones in a box. Anyway, there's this first century box with the inscription translated in English as Jacob or James, son of Joseph, brother of Jesus. Now that's archaeological evidence. Not that Jesus was a Messiah, but that accounts of him in the Bible having a brother named James, which you can see, for example, in Galatians 1.19, and being considered the son of Joseph, 
which he was considering according to Luke 3.23, are consistent. Now, some secularists said, oh, okay, this couldn't be legitimate. Somebody could just uh, uh, etched on this inscription later. But that's really not the case because this inscription contains something called patina, uh, which is caused by oxidation over time. And it's that what's there is consistent with this coming from the first century. So it wasn't something made centuries later to prove the Bible is true or Jesus was here. There's also something known as the pilot stone. It's a damaged block out of carved uh, limestone. It's got partially intact inscription. It mentions Pontius Pilate, who was prefect of the Roman province of Judea from 26 to 36 uh, AD. And it was discovered at the site of uh, Caesarea Martimina in uh, 1961, Maritima. The artifact is uh, particularly significant because it's a uh, find from the first century and it mentions Pontius Pilate. And that shows, therefore, that Pontius Pilate was there when the New Testament said he was there. What about other evidence? And I go through some of this in more depth in, in this book. But basically, non-Christian sources, such as Flavius Josephus, the Babylonian Talmud, Pliny the Younger, Tacitus, Marabar Serapion, Suetonius, Thales, Lucian, Phlegion, and Celsus, by origin, reported things about Jesus' Christianity, such as Jesus lived during the reign of Tiberius Caesar, which the New Testament confirms. He lived a virtuous life. He was some type of a wonder worker. He had a brother named James. Followers said he was the Messiah. That John the Baptist was executed by Herod. And by the way, all these things are confirmed in the New Testament. But we're talking about things outside of the New Testament. Jesus was executed by Pontius Pilate. He was executed on Passover. Darkness happened on the day he died. An earthquake happened the day he died. His disciples believed he rose from the dead. His disciples were willing to die for their beliefs. Christianity had spread to Rome. Christians denied the Roman gods. And Christians worshipped Jesus as God. Now, in modern times, uh, archaeologists have uncovered pretty much every major city or town mentioned in the New Testament book of Acts, which again shows that uh, things in this book are true. Now, I mentioned darkness, so let's uh, go into that. Uh, in Matthew uh, 27, it talks about darkness. We're going to go to Luke 23. So, And also in uh, Mark 15, 33, it talks about darkness. The passage from Luke 23, starting with verse 44, says, Now it was about the sixth hour, and there was darkness all over the earth until the ninth hour. And so we see that in the other accounts too. Then the sun was darkened, and the veil of the temple was torn in two. And when Jesus had cried out with a loud voice, he said, Father, into your hands I commit your spirit. Having said this, he breathed his last. Now, is there any evidence outside the Bible for this darkness? Yes. We've got something from Julius Africanus. He cites a work that no longer exists by a uh, Samaritan named Thallus. This is uh, from Fragment uh, 18.1. On the whole world there presented a most fearful darkness, and the rocks rent by an earthquake, and many places in Judea and other districts were thrown down. This darkness... Thales, in the third book of his history, calls as to appear to me without reason an eclipse of the sun. For the Hebrews celebrate the Passover, the 14th according to the moon, an eclipse of the sun takes only place when the moon comes out of the sun. It can't happen at any other time, but this interval between the first day of the new moon and the last of the old, that is the, their junction. How then should an eclipse happened when the moon is almost diametrically opposite the sun. Let that opinion pass, however, let it carry the majority with it. And let this uh, portent of the world be deemed the eclipse of the sun, like others portent of the eye. So what he's saying is, this happened, doesn't make sense. Physically, it shouldn't have happened during the Passover, because the 
This was a time of a full moon, not a, not a new moon. It moves in the wrong place for this darkness to happen. It was not an eclipse. It was a supernatural event. And there is evidence outside of the Bible for that. And there was somebody who I, uh, I once met, an author uh, who was in the Church of God. His name was uh, El Fieri. He wrote a book called The Darkness as a Crucifixion. And he goes through lots and lots and lots and lots of proofs of why this happened. And that, yes, it's not just one account. People knew that this happened. And this is a supernatural event. And there is historical evidence that it happened. And, uh, you know, Flavius uh, Josephus uh, talked about uh, Joseph, I mean, for Jesus, talked about Jesus. Josephus talked about Jesus. And he was a Jew, Josephus, not a Christian. He said there was, about this time, Jesus, a wise man, if it's lawful to call him a man, he was a doer of wonderful works, a teacher of uh, such men as would receive the truth. He drew over to those many of the Jews and many of the Gentiles. He was uh, the Christ that when Pilate, at the suggestion of the principal men, condemned us to the Staros. Those that loved him first uh, uh, did not forsake him because he appeared to them alive on the third day, as the divine prophets foretold. And uh, he's got some other accounts about uh, Jesus being uh, led into, uh, up by uh, Jewish leaders to get killed. Now some people think that uh, some of this was just written later after the fact or was tampered with by uh, Roman Catholic sources or something like that. But there is evidence, again, uh, of this being true. And related to that first citation from uh, Josephus, there's an Arab version in the 12th century says, and it was translated to English in the 20th century, it says, at this time was a wise man who was called Jesus. His conduct was good. He was known as virtuous. And many people from the Jews and other nations became his disciples. They reported he appeared the three days after the crucifixion. Accordingly, he was perhaps the Messiah, concerning whom the prophets and recounted wonders. So I mention this because this would not have been a Roman Catholic who changed Josephus to say what I just read a few moments ago. So Josephus had said this as well. And there are some, some other things uh, as well about that. Now, going to Jewish sources, the Talmud says, it was taught that on the eve of Passover, Yeshu, uh, which is the word for Jesus, Yeshua, was hanged. A herald went forth and cried, he's going forth to be stoned because he practiced sorcery and enticed Israel to apostasy. And who can say anything in his favor? Then him come forward and plead on his behalf. So notice that even a Jewish source said Jesus had some kind of supernatural power. Now they're calling it sorcery. Uh, some have distanced themselves from this reference because uh, uh, you know Jesus uh, was crucified. But uh, murdered by hanging on a tree, the three, and it says he was hanged here. Even and they also have him about being stoned. But Jesus was hung. The Bible says that. The New Testament says that. Jews who don't believe in Jesus don't really necessarily want to push that. But we have this from there. What about non-Jewish sources? Well, one comes from uh, uh, the Roman historian Tacitus. He said there was a rumor, you know, about Nero. Cause, uh, had this uh, fire, so Nero wanted some rumors to go out. He wanted he didn't want to be blamed for Rome being burnt down. So, since he was being blamed for it, here's what Tacitus wrote: To suppress the rumor, Nero fabricated scapegoats and punished with every refinement the notoriously depraved Christians, as they're popularly called. Their originator, Christ, had been executed in Tiberius region under the governor of Judea, Pontius Pilate. That agrees with the New Testament. But in spite of this temporary setback, the deadly superstition broke out afresh, not only in Judea, where the mischief started, but even in Rome. All degraded and shameful practices collect and flourish in the capital. First, Nero has self-acknowledged Christians arrested. So he first get those who claim to be Christians arrested. Then large numbers were condemned. Their deaths were made farcical. So we see that Tacitus was against Christianity, uh, and by the way, Tiberius was emperor from 14 to 37 AD. And remember, Jesus was killed 
3031 AD, so right during the time, that's consistent with the timing. And as far as uh, other things go, Jesus said his followers would be subject to persecution. And we have evidence here of persecution that happened. So Jesus predicted something that we see historical evidence outside the Bible happen. Now, there's a Roman historian called Suetonius, and it's something called the deified Claudius wrote, since the Jews constantly made disturbance at the instigation of Christus, he, Emperor Claudius, expelled them from Rome. Now, Claudius was emperor from 41 to 50 AD, and some believe that Christos is a misspelled reference to Christians. Uh, it's possible. We, we don't know that for sure, but whether or not it was, uh, Suetonius' writing confirms something that Luke wrote in Acts chapter 18, verses 1 through 2. After these things, Paul departed from Athens and went to Corinth. And he found a certain Jew named Aquila, born of, in Pontus, who had recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla. Because Claudius had commanded all the Jews to depart from Rome, and he came to them. So we see that both Suetonius and Luke recorded that Claudius expelled the Jews, which was also at that time included Jewish Christians, because Christians were considered to be a sect of the Jews at the time. Now, regarding Christians, here's something Suetonius wrote related to the Nero fire in 64 AD. Punishment was inflicted on the Christians, a class of men given to a new and mischievous superstition. And Julius Africanus, by the way, he referred to a first century historian, uh, Flagian of Trellis, reporting an earthquake. Flagian records that in the time of Tiberius Caesar, this has been when Jesus was being executed, at full moon there was a full eclipse of the sun at the sixth hour to the ninth, what we see from the uh, Luke's account. Manifestly, one that was, which we speak, what the eclipse has in common with the earthquake, the rending rocks, and the resurrection of the dead, so great a perturbation throughout the universe, surely no such event as this is ever recorded for a long period. And there was an earthquake at the same time, and yes, there's a full moon at the uh, Passover, but there was some type of a darkness. Origin of Alexandria mentioned that the writings of the, the secular Greek historian Plagian also uh, mentioned uh, the earthquake and darkness. I'm not going to go through there again. And uh, uh, he does this because uh, somebody he was arguing with by the name of Celsus would say, no, that was just stuff that ma people made up to try to say Jesus was the Messiah. We hear the same nonsense argument today. And Origen was saying, listen, the historian Flagian said both those things happened. Okay, When it should have been uh, not possible for there to be an eclipse, some type of eclipse of the sun happened, and an earthquake happened, and it's recorded in secular sources, which confirms the New Testament, which it did. Now sometime after 70 AD, a Syrian named uh, Mara Bar Serapion, he wrote a letter where he compared Jesus to uh, various philosophers, Greek philosophers. He said, What good did it do the Athenians to kill Socrates, for which deed they were punished with famine and pestilence? And what evil, what did it avail the Samians to burn Pythagoras, since their country was entirely burned, buried under sand? Or what did it avail the Jews to kill their wise king, since their kingdom was taken away from them from that time on? Socrates is not dead, thanks to Plato, nor Pythagoras because of Herod's statute, nor is a wise king because of the new law which he was given. So in other words, the secular source is saying getting rid of different people didn't stop their movement and caused the people who got rid of them to, have, to be punished in one way or the other. Now, Pliny the Younger, he wrote Emperor Trajan, said, It's my rule, sire, to refer you to the matters of which I am uncertain. He says, I was never present in any trial of any Christians, so I don't know what the normal penalties ought to be. 
And so he's trying to figure out, you know, what, what to do about them, and he asks them, you know, what to do. He says, any who denied that they had been or were Christians, I think they should be discharged. They're not Christians. We're not going to kill them for not being it. And if they'll curse Christ, I think it's a good idea to get rid of them, to, to not kill them as well. And so how should I do this? You know, this is just, he says, I find nothing but a depraved and extravagant superstition. So I don't know what else to do with these people who are Christians. It's, it doesn't seem like there's really much going on with them that's important. Now Trajan, he reigned from 98 to 117 AD. And here's what he told Pliny in response. You've taken the right line, my dear Pliny, in examining the cases to those denounced to you as Christians. It's extremely proper. For there's no far, hard and fast rule that we can really lay down. They're not to be sought out. If they're informed against and the charge is proved, then they are to be punished. But, however, if one denies he's a Christian and actually proves it by worshiping our gods, he'll be pardoned as a result of the recantation, even though he could have been a Christian in the past, he said. So, again, we see Christians being mentioned there. Now, in the second half of the second century, a Greek satirist and an anti-Christian named Lucian, not to be confused with the later Lucian of Antioch, who was a Church of God Christian, we think, in his death of Peregrinus, here's what he said about Christians. That one whom they still worship, who is impaled because he brought this new form of initiation to the world. Now, Lucian used this word, aniscopolopisian, sorry, my Greek is not that great, which means to impale. Impalement was understood what caused Jesus' death a century after it occurred. Anyway, Jesus did exist, and there's some evidence of what happened in the New Testament in secular literature. By the way, also, and I know some atheists and others, secularists, will point to this, contrary to their view, there actually is evidence that a census like what happened during the time of Jesus' uh, uh, birth did happen. And we have a full chapter on that in uh, this book, Proof Jesus the Messiah. Again, the book is free at ccog.org. Now, if you go to secularist websites like Wikipedia, they, their editors don't always support things about Jesus. They, Wikipedia tends to prefer a secularist view. And they uh, don't really believe the Bible. Uh, and if you see stuff like, nearly all scholars agree on Wikipedia, realize this is a reference to scholars who are either agnostic or atheistic. And I am a former editor of Wikipedia, and I can assure you that the, their editors, uh, they're, they come from a secular perspective most of the time. And if they do uh, accept uh, God some version, uh, it's based on their understanding. It's not based on not having a point of view, which Wikipedia used to claim. I don't know if they still claim that, but they certainly do have a point of view. Anyway, that being said, what are the main arguments against Jesus being Messiah by the secular and atheist writers? Well, basically, they start off saying miracles are impossible, so they can't happen, and that if there are some prophecies that were fulfilled, the evidence was faked or it's just coincidental. Uh, they basically accuse writers of the New Testament of bias and embellishments, and make it appear that, uh, to, to make it look like Jesus is Messiah, even though they say he was not. They also point to atrocities by people or churches that claim to be Christians as proof that Jesus didn't bring any particularly good message for humankind. And that's actually basically what Richard Dawkins' book called The uh, God Delusion uh, says. Now, his book was not written as a defense of atheism as much as it seemed to be opposed to religions that claim the Bible. He also didn't like Islam. Non-believers uh, seem to be gravitated toward many of his views, uh, basically to try to rationalize not accepting a religion. Now, my own read of Dawkins' book concluded he had a lot of negative experience with the religious people throughout his life. In most of the book, he basically gives his opinions on various matters and provides basically opinions of others his book is not written like it's some documented proof. And it's definitely not an intellectual basis for discounting the true God of the Bible. 
Now, the God delusion, in my opinion, is that those who believe the book disproves the existence of God themselves are being delusional. And uh, it, in my opinion, it should be called the atheist delusion because it's just stuff people want to tell themselves that's simply not the case. And I'm going to go through some of their arguments uh, in, in a moment. I'm looking through because of the book, I want, book that I want to hold up in a minute here. Anyway, since anti-Jesus writers don't believe the New Testament, they rarely understood that the true Christian church would be a little flock, as Jesus said in Luke 12, 32. That we're going to be persecuted, we'd be the persecuted, not the persecutors. Nor would we ever be militaristic. It would only be found a few, and the only remnant would be offered salvation in this age with others to have the opportunity uh, in the uh, uh, age to come. And I looking through here because I just have a book on that. Uh, Universal offers salvation. Most people do not understand what the Bible really teaches about salvation and that uh, even atheists who repent uh, at the second resurrection will have an opportunity for salvation. But anyway, these things that I'm talking about were beliefs of the original church. Uh, I held up that one book which is documented with lots and lots of scriptures. But a lot of people, when they hear of the term Christian church, they think of the, uh, um, either the, the Greco-Roman Catholics or the uh, Protestants. And these two books, which are also free at ccog.org, document that the original Catholic Church uh, had teachings for peace and are different from the practices that you see in the Greco-Roman Catholic Churches these days, as well as the Protestants. Protestants claim Sola Scriptura. This book documents that, one, nothing resembling the modern Protestant religion will you find by faithful in the first couple of centuries of the Christian era. So that's one issue. And secondly, it's also documents that Protestants don't really believe in Sola Scriptura. If you're a Protestant and you think you do believe in Sola Scriptura and you actually read this book and understand it. I can't understand how you could possibly think that Protestantism is based on uh, Sola Scriptura. That's my challenge to the Protestant. Anyway, uh, most people do not know uh, what happened to the true church, and because they don't know what happened to the true church, uh, they uh, don't understand Christianity, and so they have a tendency to discount it, and I think this, the hypocrisy and the falseness of the uh, professing, most professing Christian faiths has turned a lot of people off. More on history, we've got book, booklets and books, uh, Where is the True Christian Church Today? And the Continuing History of Church of God for more about that. Anyway, having said all that, I bought a book called uh, There Is No Jesus, There Was No Jesus, There Was No God by uh, a Dr. Uh, Raphael uh, Lassiter. And it brought up uh, a lot of personal beliefs and opinions. And I'm going to go through uh, uh, 16 of them. Number one, he writes, pro -Jesus, uh, his basic position is that pro-Jesus scholars are biased in order to keep their funding. Now, that doesn't prove Jesus is not the Messiah. Now, some people are... Uh, in the arguments that Lasseter brings up, by the way, are just foolish. You know, um, but anyway, as it turns out, I'm a pro-Jesus scholar, and I don't take any salary from my church. I don't get, um, uh, when I did a lecture for a church university, I didn't get uh, paid for that. I didn't ask for it. But even if I did take a salary, that doesn't prove that my writings are distorted for fear of losing funding. And as followers, other scholars go, sure, funding overly affects them, whether they believe in God or not. There's no real evidence that pro-Jesus scholars are more financially biased than other scholars. Anyway, that's not proof against Jesus. The, the next one is one of the other more absurd ones, and that is sources uh, that have miracles can't be seriously considered. Well, if you're unwilling to consider documented evidence that a divine, then this shows a closed mind. And that's also what's known as circular reasoning. Unwillingness to look at evidence does not disprove the existence of God or Jesus. You know, if you say, the Bible says there's a miracle, miracles are impossible, therefore there's no God. That's not proof. I even, again, referred to one earlier about the darkness coming. 
it's not supposed to be able to happen, but according to historians, it did happen. So that's a miracle, and so that you know, there is proof outside the Bible of miracles. The next thing, number th third point he wrote down was, gospel accounts are not eyewitnesses. Well, the gospel account certainly did involve eyewitnesses. Luke's gospel said he expressly had eyewitness testimony, which he recorded for, as certainty. Uh, Matthew was a disciple of Jesus, and he was an eyewitness. And in John uh, 21, 24, John wrote, this is the disciple who testifies these things and wrote these things, and we know his testimony is true. He was an eyewitness. And in 2 Peter 1, 16, Peter says he was an eyewitness. Though his, his, uh, his, Peter's epistles weren't cited in uh, Lester's book as eyewitness accounts, it was. And furthermore, it's traditionally believed that Peter told Mark to write down that gospel account. So, uh, Lasseter has ignored eyewitness accounts, trying to make you sound like there's no eyewitnesses, and this is the case. Then he asserts, gospel accounts cannot be taken seriously as primary source evidence. Well, of course they can be taken seriously. When people like Dr. Lasseter don't, uh, it doesn't change the content or the usefulness of Scripture. You know, it says in uh, 2 Peter 3, All script, verse 16, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. And there's like a dozen or so predictions Jesus made in the Gospels that have been fulfilled, came to pass, outside of the Bible or the New Testament. He claims, okay, Lester claims, number five, Old Testament is a bad source for Apostle Paul to use to point to Jesus. Well, the Old Testament is an excellent source to provide information of, uh, about Jesus, as Paul and others have. Jesus filled at least 200 prophecies. As I say, I've, I've held the, our uh, free book up, uh, uh, Jesus is the Messiah. There it is. And the, 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 they're in here. You can read the 200, in, and then the, the verses in the New Testament that confirm it. I want to read something that Peter wrote. 2 Peter 3, starting verse 14. Why don't you go there, because I'll be there for a moment. We're going to go through several verses here. Peter writes, Therefore, beloved, looking forward to these things, be diligent to be found by him in peace, without spot and blameless, and consider that the long-suffering of our Lord is salvation. As also our beloved Paul, according to his wisdom given to him, has written to you, as also in his apostles, speaking in those, them of those these things, in which are some things hard to understand, which untaught and unstable people twist their own destruction, as they do also to the rest of the scriptures. You therefore, beloved, since you knew this beforehand, beware lest you fall from your own steadfastness fastness, and be led away by the error of the wicked, but grow in grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Christians aren't supposed to fall for arguments of people who twist and don't believe the scriptures. Uh, the sixth point I want to mention, Lasseter says, historians have no good reason to trust Paul. Well, early tradition says Paul was martyred for his Christian beliefs. He was stoned, uh, beaten, whipped, and jailed because of them. We can read in 2 Corinthians 11. That shows he had great dedication to those beliefs. And we also see he didn't preach because he wanted money. You can see that in Acts 20. The fact that others accompanied him thought that they thought he was credible. Facts about him are also confirmed in the books of Acts. And also uh, cities mentioned, I mentioned before, that he went to or found by historians. So yeah, there's a reason to consider that Paul was truly caught, taught by Jesus and could be trusted. Claiming he's not a credible source does not disprove Jesus as a Messiah. Here's another nonsense claim from Lasseter's book. This is number seven. Gospels cannot be considered as primary sources. The Gospels being written 40 or more years after the supposed death of Jesus could also eliminate the possibility of being written by eyewitnesses long after the fact, considering the life expectancies of the first century. Now, there's a whole bunch of nonsense in that that he just said. The Gospels are credible sources. 
and they were written uh, uh, before then. And again, we have a book that go in, goes into this, Who Gave the World the Bible? Uh, the Gospels are written before then and by eyewitnesses. But he just says this, and people say, oh, yeah, it must be. Now, as far as uh, uh, other sources, uh, Blasseter should know it was reported the Apostle John died sometime during the reign of Emperor Trajan, which meant John was alive to at least 98 AD. So he was alive, and he was still an eyewitness, even if he'd have written that late. Furthermore, as far as life expectancy, I should mention that uh, Polycarp of Smyrna, who was a disciple of the Apostle John, lived to be 104. And uh, there's also uh, a claim that uh, one of the other uh, bishops of Jerusalem lived to over 100 as well, around that time frame. It's, while it's true that a lot of people died in infancy, so the average lifespan was lower, lower those who made it through adulthood tended to live, and they didn't go to wars and stuff, they tended to live a long time, they didn't get some illness. So he's trying to point to something that's not factually correct. But a lot of atheists apparently uh, accept that. Number eight, he wrote, With regards to the miraculous and supernatural claims found in the Gospels, such as the virgin birth, Jesus walking in water, biblical scholars of all type find them to be problematic. Uh, no, biblical scholars uh, do believe in the uh, virgin birth and walking in water. Uh, it's the secular people who call themselves scholars and the religious scholars who don't believe it. If you truly, if, if you believe the word of God, you know you have to, you would believe that. Then. Number nine, okay, remember, he got rid of the Gospels, even though they're written by eyewitnesses, now they don't count, and they're written too late, all the stuff he claims. He says, non-biblical references are generally unimportant. Go, I just went through a bunch of those non-biblical references. They are important, because they do show there's evidence outside the Gospels, outside the book of Acts, outside the New Testament, that, hey, what they talked about did happen, or at least parts of it happened. You know, the, uh, there's no proof that Josephus' or Tassus' writings related to Christianity were altered to the point of worthlessness. Lasseter has basically claimed that they would have been cited in earlier literature if they were legit. However, that claim is not proof. Others have found Josephus' and Tacitus' writings were sufficiently reliable to, to use them. You know, Revelation 22, verse 15 warns about anyone who loves and practices a lie, and those who refuse to accept Jesus, I say, are clinging to a lie. His 11th point is Roman documents of relevant time periods were destroyed to prevent embarrassment to the Roman Catholic Church. Well, it's true that the Church of Rome destroyed documents, but the claim that certain missing government, Roman government documents were destroyed has not been proven. Furthermore, if they were so destroyed, it might have been to prevent the Church of Rome embarrassment. That doesn't mean the content would be embarrassment to the continuing Church of God. Because anything that's true would not be an embarrass should not be an embarrassment to uh, to the church, even if our leaders made mistakes. Okay, all of people make mistakes. All right, his point number twelve. Lasseter says Christianity is a syncretic blend of Judaism, Hellenism, Mithraism, and Egyptian elements. Well, it's true that the Greco-Roman churches have done stuff like that. The original church did not was not like that. I'm holding up again. Well, at least the original Catholic Church. The original Catholic Church didn't have elements of Mithraism, such as uh, uh, Jesus being born on December 25th, which is the birthday of the sun god Mithras, uh, or uh, uh, going to church on uh, Sunday instead of Saturday. Mithra did the Day of the Sun. Uh, Mithraism taught various other things, involved crosses and other, other types of things as well that uh, the Egyptians also had. So while he can claim what he considered Christianity, true Christianity wasn't based on it. And the Christian faith is not uh, uh, syncretic, and the Bible actually warns about that, particularly in the New Testament. It tells us to contend earnestly for the faith once for all delivered to the saints, Jude 3, and that did not include uh, Egyptian elements or Mithraism. 13. Lester writes, it's up to the believer to prove that their God exists. Well, actually, God of the Bible 
challenges people to prove themselves whether or not he exists. He doesn't require Christians to prove it to others that he exists, but he does expect them to uh, be able to give proper answers to questions, which is one of the reasons I've held up various pieces of uh, uh, literature, including one I keep looking for, and I keep putting so many books over it, I don't see it. I'll have to find it again uh, when, I, when I get to it. Number 14 says, uh, Christians pose or use philosophical arguments to prove God exists. Yet why must it be the Judeo-Christian God? Okay. And uh, let me go to the... Just to say that, yeah, there's uh, philosophical arg arguments that uh, prove that there's a God. And that's the book I keep wanting to look at. We have a booklet here called, Is God's Existence Logical? You can prove God's existence is logical. I am a uh, licensed and published scientist, uh, and I believe it's unscientific to say that uh, life sprang from nothing, from non-life. Uh, my view is, is scientific, it is backed by science. There's other aspects of uh, the universe that only make sense if there is something spiritual, a spirit being, a god. Now. That, the fact that there had to be something that created it doesn't of itself prove that the God of the Bible created it. That part is correct. However, if you look at all the details and you look at all the scriptures, you can prove it's the uh, uh, God of the Bible who is the true God. Uh, and he, claim, he goes further, it says, 15, We have no good evidence for the existence of any God worthy of that name, let alone a specific God such as Yahweh, the commonly accepted God of Judeo-Christianity. Well, as far as uh, Yahweh goes, and Yahweh being, fulfilled prophecy is, is sufficient evidence, but uh, he doesn't want to look at that. And furthermore, the fact that he says, on one hand, you can't pay attention to miracles. On the other hand, he says, uh, there's, there's no God, evidence of God, any God worthy of the name. Well, a God worthy of the name would be able to do miracles, and our God does do miracles. Yet, uh, people like Dr. Lasser said it's not even possible. It's a little wonder he rejects the truth because he's got so much of circular reasoning going on. But you don't have to be like him, and you can believe and act in the truth about Jesus. Now, he had a 16th point where he claimed that mathematics demonstrates the implausibility of Jesus and God. But he didn't actually, he goes in a lot of details about it, but he doesn't use any numbers. And if he did, we assume it would be based on his own biases. Now, I want to read something that the Apostle Paul warned Timothy. And this is 1 Timothy uh, chapter 6, starting in verse 20. O Timothy, guard what was committed to your trust, avoiding the profane and idle babblings and contradictions of what is falsely called knowledge. By professing it, some have strayed from the faith. Grace be with you. Amen. Some think they have knowledge in conflict with Scripture. They also don't have grace, nor do they value grace, but they should. Don't let supposedly educated people deceive you. Facts are one thing, but twisting them and providing false information is wrong, even if the person providing it supposedly is educated. Now, as far as mathematics go, let me state that the mathematicians, that mathematicians at Tufts University have conclude the uh, physical universe must have had a beginning. They asserted the idea that it did not have a beginning is mathematically flawed. Anyway, since something doesn't come from nothing, mathematics is pointing towards the view of a non-physical being creating the universe. Now, speaking of mathematics, perhaps it should be mentioned that the late professor of mathematics, Peter Stoner, calculated the probability of someone could fulfill eight of the messianic prophecies that Jesus did. The eight were Bethlehem birth. He concluded that to be one to t uh, and ten to the fifth power. Announced by a forerunner messenger, like it says in Malachi, he considers that one uh, ten to the third power. Entering Jerusalem on a donkey, one to the second power, ten to the second power. Betrayed by a friend and uh, uh, ten to the third power. Having a uh, Silver used to buy a potter's field, he figured that 10 to the 5th power, 1 in 10. Suffering when afflicted, he considered that to be 1 to the 3rd uh, uh, power, 
10 to the third power and have his hand and feet pierced, uh, 1 and 10 to the fourth power. That probability goes to uh, uh, 10 to the 28th power, which is 10 octillion. Now, some have claimed if you take this 10 octillion number and you divide it by the number of people they suspect were born from the time of the prophecies to modern times, the odds become even uh, is more. It's 10 to the 17th power, which means the probability is 1 in 100 quadrillion, quadrillion against any human being fulfilling them. Yet Jesus did, and not only did he do that, he also did a couple hundred other prophecies. Okay? So we're talking about a mathematical thing that's impossible unless God directed it and God made it happen. Mathematics actually points to Jesus being uh, uh, the Messiah, not the other way around. Anyway, none of Dr. Lasseter's points prove that there was no Jesus. The Bible talks about people who are wrong and foolish. And I would say the arguments that Lasseter brings up are basically red herring arguments. They're not actual proof, but they're just uh, presented like they're proof, but they're not. They're mostly just basically just opinion. Now, Lasseter himself admits, by the way, that Jesus could have existed. And he realizes there's absolutely no proof that there was no Jesus, even though that's the title of his book. He said, ah, there could have been a Jesus. So then why does his book say there was no Jesus, there's no God? Uh, the New Testament in 1 John 2.22 teaches, who is a liar but he who denies Jesus is the Christ. And sadly, it's just not enough who are truly interested in the truth. Now, various ones will discount the Old Testament and claim the writers of the New Testament were biased and they did these things and there was nothing supernatural about Jesus. But Jesus made a variety of predictions that have come to pass after uh, the writers wrote the New Testament. For example, let's go to Matthew 26. It says, when Jesus was in Bethany, uh, verse 6, the house of the leper, a woman came to him, and she put on fragrant oil and poured it on his head. The disciples didn't like it. Look, this is a waste of money. should have been gone to the poor. But verse 10, Jesus was aware of that. He said, Why do you trouble the woman? For she's done a good work for me. For you have the poor with you always, but me you do not always have. For in the pouring this fragrant on my body, she did it for my burial. Surely I say to you, wherever this gospel is preached in, this, in the whole world, what this woman has done will be told as a memorial to her. And that has been done. And it's also uh, taught by me now. It's been taught in uh, a book about Jesus being Messiah. Jesus also said, Matthew 24, verse 5, For many will come in my name, saying, I, Jesus, am the Christ, and will deceive many. And that certainly happened throughout history. Okay, How many people say, Okay, I'll say myself. I am Bob Teal. Others will call, claim to be Bob Teal throughout history. I am Bob Teal throughout history. It's like, no, it's, 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 it's not going to follow me like that. It's, and uh, I, I wouldn't go out and say that, um, even though perhaps people in uh, the, this time will be written in the New Testament. But I mean, Jesus made some statements about himself. He said, well, he was Jesus. Well, why would that matter if he wasn't anybody? He wasn't important. He wasn't going to be important. Jesus warned about persecuting persecutions coming to his followers in John 16:16. Uh, 16, 16. He said the time's coming when those who kills you will think they're doing God a service. Now this happened in the book of Acts, but we all see it outside the Bible. And the Jewish Talmud uh, uh, advocated uh, putting uh, Christians out of the synagogue. Uh, there's also records of various persecutions throughout history. And in Matthew 10:17, Jesus warned about going before councils. But beware of men, they deliver you up to councils and scourge you in their synagogues. This happened to many, uh, if not all, of the original apostles and the apostle Paul. And we've seen this type of persecution throughout history. And there was a major Jewish persecution of those professed Christ in 524 AD. Jesus also said in Matthew 10, 18, the next verse, You'll be bought, brought before governors and kings for my name's sake as a testimony to them and to the Gentiles. This happened to Paul in the first century, as well as the late pastor general of the Worldwide Church of God in the 20th century. Although he wasn't forcibly brought, he went and saw them 
needed me to write a testimony to the Gentiles. I've met with, let's say, some lower level uh, Gentile uh, political people or government people. And we'll see what happens in the future with that. Six, Jesus said people would uh, claim to prophesy and cast out demons in his name. Matthew 7, verse 22. Many will come to me in that day and say, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, done many wonders in your name? And I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Well, in that day isn't here yet. Yet throughout history, various false ones have claimed to cast out demons in Jesus' name, prophesy in his name, and claim wonders in his name. You know, how many people, like in my case, people would say, you're going to cast out demons in my, my personal name? Uh, I suppose maybe it could happen, but there's no way I'd go out and say it was going to happen. But Jesus said that about himself, and that has happened. Jesus said the church would last. Matthew 16, 18, I will build my church, and the gates of Hades, the grave will not prevail against it. Okay? Well, we're going almost 2,000 years since, and the true church of God still exists. So... And Matthew twenty four thirty five, Jesus said, "Heaven and earth will pass away; my words will by no means pass away." I mentioned there's fifty eight hundred ancient documents. They're actually in Greek, of related to the New Testament, which is and it's actually two point six million pages. Okay, so Jesus said his words will not pass away, and uh, his words have been translated to at least fifteen hundred twenty one languages. And the people are working on more of them. These are kind of bold claims to make, but they've happened. People don't seem to think, hey, if Jesus wasn't Messiah, then why? Are these all just lucky guesses that Jesus has? How many lucky guesses do you have to have before it starts to sink in that maybe these are real prophecies and there's something divine behind it? In Matthew 24, 14, Jesus said, This gospel will be preached in all the world as a witness to all nations, and the end will come. And substantial evidence has been done to do this throughout the centuries. Some have claimed the gospel has already been preached in all the world, and a partial witness has been given to many nations. And it will, when it is uh, completely fulfilled to God's satisfaction, uh, the end will come, probably in the next decade. And here's something, Matthew 24, verses 1 through 2. Jesus went out and departed from the temple. The disciples came to, up to show him the buildings of the temple. And Jesus said to them, You not see all these things? Assuredly I say to you, not one stone will be left on another that shall not be thrown down. History records this was fulfilled by the Roman general Titus in 70 AD. Now skeptics have tried to claim that uh, Matthew or somebody else wrote this after the destruction, making it seem like uh, Jesus predicted it, but they don't have any proof didn't predict it. But they don't have any proof of that. Actually, there's internal statements in Matthew's account uh, that uh, would have been written differently if the uh, temple had already been destroyed. We go into that in our, uh, our book about proof that Jesus is the Messiah. So I'll hold up again here. I should comment that the anti-miracle scholars have no legitimate argument against uh, these, or these predictions from Jesus coming to pass. There's just too many to dismiss them as lucky guesses. And in uh, Matthew 9, verse 15, Jesus said, Can the uh, bridegroom mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them? But ties will come and the bridegroom will take it away from them and then they will fast. And Christians have fasted throughout history. How would Jesus know that would happen? Another lucky guess, apparently, they say. Okay, here's the twelfth one. Now this is a conditional statement made by Jesus after his resurrection. We're going to go to the book of uh, Revelation. 2 verse 1. And to the angel of the church of Ephesus write, Remember therefore from whence you have fallen, repent and do the first works, or else I'll come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place, unless you repent. Revelation 2 verses 1 through 5. Now, when Jesus said this, Ephesus was the most important city in Asia Minor. It was a major coastal uh, port. Centuries later, uh, Ephesus lost its prominence. It ends up, because of silting, to be about six miles or about ten kilometers away from uh, the coast. My wife and I personally uh, verified this when we were last in Ephesus. 
Jesus also made predictions about the other churches of Revelation 2 and 3 that have come to pass that I'm not going to go to in this sermon. And Jesus made other predictions that are listed in the Gospels uh, that were fulfilled in the Gospels, which also I didn't uh, go into here. But there is proof if people want to see the proof, if people are willing to accept the truth. Now, as I mentioned before, in Revelation 19.10, the Bible teaches, worship God for the testimony of Jesus is a spirit of prophecy. Jesus fulfilled many prophecies and made predictions that have already been fulfilled. And I told you about a couple hundred of them uh, in the Old Testament for him. The prophetic testimony of the Bible, including the Old Testament, prophesies that Jesus fulfilled many things. It's proof that he is the Messiah. He arrived when he was supposed to arrive. And he did the things that the Messiah was supposed to do. Now, let's go to Isaiah 46. Starting in verse 9. In the Old Testament, which had those 200 plus predictions about Jesus, it says, Remember the former things of old. Isaiah 46, starting in verse 9. For I am God, and there is no other. I am God, and there is no other. Declaring the end from the beginning, and from ancient times, things that are not yet done saying, My counsel shall stand, and I will do all my pleasure. Calling a bird of prey from the east, the man who executes my counsel from a far country, indeed I have spoken it, I will also bring it to pass. I have purposed it, I will also do it. Only God can make such predictions and make them happen. Multiple fulfilled prophecies are absolute proof that Jesus is the Messiah. And if you're concerned about the future, Jesus made other predictions that will shortly, probably within the next decade or so, be fulfilled and will come to pass. If atheists would accept the truth, they would accept Jesus. One problem the atheists have, as well as others not accepting Jesus, is that the vast majority of those who claim Jesus as Messiah don't practice his teachings or, or those of his uh, faithful disciples throughout history. For one example, the apostles and their faithful followers were not militaristic and would not fight in the military or even watch violent sports. If atheists understood this and some other truths about real Christianity, they might be more inclined to at least consider that Christian faith is not a force for evil. Now, yes, people who claim Christianity have been a force for evil, but the true Christian faith has not been a force for evil in this world. And uh, for more information about that, I've held up these books. I want to hold them up again. Hope of Salvation, How the Continuing Church of God Differs from Protestantism, and Beliefs of the Original Catholic Church. Again, available at the ccog.org website. You can document what the original Christian church believed. Now, the Bible has some rough things to say about atheists. Psalm uh, 14, verse 1. It's also repeated in Psalm 53, verse 1 and 2. Fool has said in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. They've done abominable iniquity. There's none that does good. God looks down from heaven upon the children of men to, to see if they or if there's any who understand who seek God. If people will understand and will seek God and seek the truth, they can prove that Jesus is the Messiah. Now in the New Testament, I want to go to Romans chapter 1. It's not just mentioned in the Old Testament. The New Testament, Romans 1, starting in verse 18, says the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and righteousness of men who suppress the truth and unrighteousness. That's what I think of Lassiter's book and uh, Dawkins' book. Because what may be known of God is manifest to them, for God has shown it to them. The reason I'm holding this up is you can prove it. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things which are made, including the fact that things are alive, even his eternal power and Godhead, so they're without excuse. Because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor became thankful. They became futile in their thoughts, and were, their foolish hearts were darkened. This is one of the reasons I want to listen to lies. Professing to be wise, they became fools, and changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man, birds and four-footed animals and creeping things. And so we see that there were people who basically prophesied to become evolutionists and mother earthers. 
In verse 28, Romans 1, it says, Even they did not want to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a debased mind to do those things which are not fitting. It goes through various aspects of immorality that many of you are embracing these days. But let's go to uh, 1 Timothy chapter 2. I'm going to start toward the end of verse 3. Everyone, including atheists, can be saved if they repent. 1 Timothy 2 and of verse 3, God our Savior, who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. You can come to the knowledge of the truth. Now, if you already believe, why is such proof important? Well, one of the reasons is to be consistent with the practice of early Christians, because they taught, by the way, that Jesus fulfilled prophecies. You need to know because you need to have certainty of the, our faith, and persecutions are going to be coming, and we don't want to be double-minded. Furthermore, I want to go to 1 Peter 3, verse 15. This time I'm going to read from the Old King James. 1 Peter 3, 15. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and be ready always to give an answer to every man who asks of you for a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. There are more and more non-believers and atheists these days, so knowing various proofs uh, can be helpful. And I held up uh, this book, which at least proves that there is a God. The better you know that Jesus is the Messiah, the better that you can prove it, the more steadfast you'll be. We're supposed to know and act on the truth, as we see in the Bible. Christians should support God's work as Philadelphian Christians. At the time of the end, however, Jesus warned that most Christians would uh, not be hot in supporting the work, but they'd be lukewarm. So much so that Jesus threatened to bomb them out of their mouth unless they repent. Unless they repent. We've probably all been later seen at some point in time. Anyway, we need to truly believe with certainty. And as far as prophecies go, I want to go to uh, uh, 1 Thessalonians 5. I'm going to read verse uh, uh, 20 and 21. The New Testament says, the Apostle Paul wrote, Do not despise prophecies. Test all things. Hold fast what is good. And hopefully the sermon has helped you get there. Yes, I referred you to other places you can prove all things and not just take my word for it. We, the details are there if you want to, if you're willing to go and look. Notice the Bible doesn't say, Have blind faith in nonsense. Test all things. Hold fast what's good. Do not despise prophecies. Or in the old... King James says, prove all things, hold fast what's good. Now understand, Jesus is going to return. In Luke 21, verse 36, Jesus said, Watch therefore, pray always, you may be counted worthy to escape all these things that come to pass and stand before the Son of Man. But persecutions are going to hit before he comes. For, uh, also, uh, I mentioned Daniel 11, but also Daniel 7, 25, Revelation uh, 13, 18, and uh, Revelation 14. We need to be ready. Now, Jesus was and is the prophesied Messiah. Uh, we have a booklet that I've got down here. I keep, keep changing my order here. Called Is God Calling You? That uh, you may want to read. Irrespective of your past, God can be calling you now if you're willing to go forward. You don't have to go there, but 1 John 1, 9 says, If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just forgive us our sins and cleanse us for all unrighteousness. Now let's go to Romans chapter 10. Romans 10, starting verse 8. What's it say? The word is near to you, in your mouth or in your heart. That is, the word of faith which we preach. Which is what I'm trying to do now. That if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in all your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. The scripture says, whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich to all who call on him. For whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Jesus was and is the prophesied Savior and Messiah. Those who properly obey him upon being baptized are given God's spirit. And uh, Peter knew people would be called during his age and later. For example, in Acts 2.38, Peter said, 
Repent and let everyone be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for remission of sins, and you'll receive the gifts of the Holy Spirit. The promise is to you and to your, off, your children and those who are far off, as many as our Lord God will call. And in, I want to read from Ephesians, Ephesians 2, starting verse 8. For by grace you've been saved through faith, and that's not of yourself, it's a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. But you can go and look at the truth, so you'll understand it, and God will call you. And if you are called, we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand, we should walk in them. And how should we walk? Jesus said, John 15, 13, 14, Greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. You're my friends, you do whatever I command you. We all need to obey God, repent, and really accept Jesus as Lord and Savior, be his friend, be properly baptized, walk in good works, and live as God wants us to live. Jesus came in order to make eternity better uh, for us and for everyone else. We need to endure the end to be saved. We need to believe in truth and act on it. Jesus is the Messiah, and whether you're an atheist or uh, whatever background you may have, you can prove that if you're willing to pursue the truth. And I hope that the literature and the scriptures I've brought up today will assist you along that process. This is Dr. Bob Teal for the Continuing Church of God.